You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident panelist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore data. Man, it's good to say that again. I feel like I haven't done a podcast in two months. And honestly, I wasn't even sure I wanted to come down here. I'm tired. But man, as soon as I sat down at this computer, put the headset on, it's like, oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, it's go time. Now with that said, um, well, first of all, for those that are not in the loop and don't have any idea what's going on, my wife and I had our fourth baby. It was an extended stay. I, uh, in the Facebook group slash page slash Twitter, characterized it similar to the Washington Redskins game last year. I know it's not their name anymore, but it was last year. Anyways, started off fine. Then it started to be not fine. Then it started to get scary. But in the end, we won. And although you maybe didn't exactly like how it all turned out, at the end of the day, a win's a win. So at this particular point in time, mom and baby are 100% healthy. Everything is fine. A little bit rocky, a little bit scary for for a blip. But um, I don't know. I'm starting to think that's just par for the course. We've had a couple couple experiences so far where things just don't go as planned. And that's just part of the the gig, I guess. Um, So that's why I've been absent. Do apologize for that. I know it's a terrible time to be gone. Although, let, let, let's start with this. One of the things I was going to tell you is it's going to be just kind of rapid fire today because I've been, although I've kind of been half paying attention, I, I haven't really been organizing thoughts and really putting them into fuller context and all that kind of stuff. So I, I have a general idea of, of what's happened. Probably missed a couple things here and there. Maybe a little bit of context missing over here, which if I am, whatever. But let's let's start with this. As much as it's not great to miss the cut down dates and all that kind of stuff, and I know as far as this partic- partic- particular, I don't know how you spell that, but as far as this particular point in the season, it's one of the most like important things in all of fandom, right? This is huge cut down day, right? But honestly, is it? Is anything that happened consequential even a little bit? I don't think it is. I mean, I, I, I don't want to be flippant about people that lost their jobs or, or not excited about people that, that won, but how many things that happened this past weekend have anything to do with week one? How big of a role did you expect Jay Kumaro to have in our success over the Minnesota Vikings? Or Reggie Begleton? Some of you I know. Kumaro and Begleton, like they're, it's basically wide receiver two and three right there. But... If we step back from fantasy land a little bit, they were going to have no impact. I don't think any of them, maybe, maybe Kumaro gets a couple snaps. I don't think either of them were even going to play. So cut down day has some ramifications and no question it's one of the more exciting things that goes on during that period. We've all been doing 53 projections and all this stuff and, you know, who's going to be on the team and who's going to be off and are they going to sign them to this practice squad and all that stuff. But ultimately... And I'm not talking about IR, I'm not talking about injuries because there's a couple things that have some implications. I'm talking about the people that were a part of the the cutdowns that are no longer a part of the team. It just, it really doesn't have an impact on the season very much. Now, maybe further down the line, if there are injuries, we can have concerns. But none of the starters are gone, right? There was never really a big competition as far as who's going to, even, even during camp. There's not a lot of competitions going on. Like, actual, who's the starter? We know who the starting safeties are. There's no question there. Linebacker was getting a little bit iffy, but we kind of knew Christian Kirksey was the guy. And we really only ever use one, so that's it's, it's Kirksey. Off the edge, we know who the first two are, and we have no question about who the number three is. Defensive line is Kenny Clark, and then Dean Lowry, and then hopefully Kingsley Kiki can kind of step up. So we kind of know that. The offensive line, which we'll talk about, I don't think is, again, maybe I'm missing some context, but I keep hearing massive panic about the offensive line, and I see zero reason to panic about anything, but we'll get to that. I think the offensive line is relatively set, depending on the injury to Rick Wagner, assuming he's okay, which I think he is, 
I don't really think there's any complications there in terms of who the starters are, and especially when we talk about 53 cut down, has no imp- impact outside of who the backups are going to be. The wide receivers, well, a little bit there, but, you know, MVS, EQ, Devontae, Lazard. We kind of assumed those were the top four. They remained the top four. Everybody else after that, just, I mean, what's unless there's a spate of injuries, right, running back, you know, Dexter was a little bit surprising, but they put him on practice squad, which, you know, again, not all that surprising. Even if you're thinking Dexter could have an impact on the season, it's it's tempered with the reality that it's going to be a very small role. I mean, how in the world does he get any sizable chunk, unless we're cutting Jamal or trading Jamal, which given A.J. Dillon's, you know, slow progression into this, Jamal is still incredibly important to the team, right? probably the best pass blocker on the team, a really solid receiver, and that's not a small thing. And then tight end, obviously Jace and DeGuara are going to make the team. Mercedes more than likely was never going to get cut unless they were just waiting to see, you know, it could be one of those things where we got to see if these guys can get up to speed. If they can, we'll cut Mercedes. If, if not, we won't, but that was never really that big of a thing. If they had done that, it might have some implications, but they didn't. And then Tanyan was kind of a, you know, what are they, are, are they going to roll with Tanyan a little? And they did. So again, there's no real implications. Top to bottom, the guys that we expect to have any even slightly sizable amount of playing time, they're still there. And there was never really any concern about it. So, you know, I, I just, I can't dedicate, even though I missed the whole thing and I feel this, this obligation to come in and really dive into the 53, it kind of just doesn't, I'm ready to move on. I mean, I'm, I'm having a hard time not talking about Minnesota, which I'm, I might have to a little bit, because I'm telling you, the absolute disrespect is just out of control, but I'm, you know, I'm going to try to stay away from that as best as I can, because obviously at some point, I'm going to have to do a, you know, an actual pregame thing, and I don't want to ruin that whole episode, because I'm just, I go on an absolute tirade day one, but the Vikings fans are out of control, I just had Brian Schultz from the Facebook group send me an e- a, a text saying ESPN projects last place finish for Packers in the NFC standings. I just, you know, and and again, I understand clickbait, and I really should stop playing into this, but it's just, I just, I wish somebody had a rational argument. I I, I would have no problem sitting down, and I've I've done this in the past. I did it last year when I talked Packers Bears completely reasonable, rational discussion about the, the every every team has their pros and their cons. Brian asked me yesterday, how do you feel about the, the Packers-Vikings game? I said, you know, mentally, logically, it's, it's the Packers all the way, right? Everything about this game screams Packers win. But my gut, my, my heart, and a lot, a lot of it is just anxiety, probably a little less than 50% because I'm just... I'm just nervous, right? I don't know what's going to happen. I, I just, I'm terrified of losing. So my gut just says, this, is, this isn't good, and I'm, I'm nervous and I'm scared. So I, you know, I don't know. It's hard to interpret your gut, regardless of how big it is, apparently. All right, so I have no problem really just kind of laying it out and, and talking rationally with rational people. I would love to do like a round table with a Lions fan, a Bears fan, and a, a van, fan, and a Vikings fan. And I would rather do, and I know like the... The fun thing to do is just go at each other's throat and everything, but but a lot of that is just stupid because it's not 100% either way. There's no guarantees in anything. Anybody that's even more than 70% sure doesn't understand anything about football because nothing is 70%. It just just this is why like survivor pools are, are like impossible. I've never made it past like week four in a survivor pool, even by just say because lately when and I should find another survivor pool. Maybe we could do a group survivor pool. That'd be kind of fun if I can find one. I don't know. But I, I've even started just picking the most obvious games just because I, as bad of a strategy as that is, I can't even make it past week four. We might as well just go with the most obvious ones every week, and I still lose because football's ridiculous. But some of this stuff, man, it's just, come on, guys. It's devoid of thought. And I, you know, some, some of this is on purpose. Some of this is clickbait, but I, I don't even understand. I, I try to be a little clickbaity sometimes because I want people to be interested but just saying stupid stuff because I want people to show up and yell at me, right? Like the the Vikings thing. I got a ton of attention from Vikings. I don't want that kind of attention, right? I just, I don't. I don't want 
stupid people to show up and, and come at me with stupid arguments that don't make sense. Because that upsets me. Right? I, it's not that I'm against disagreement. I just can't handle Packers will finish fourth in the NFC North. Where in the world does that come from? Again, and I, I shouldn't do this, but I, I just let's just real quick, because I'm, I'm going to have a, a conniption here. I don't even know what that is, but it's a thing that I feel like is going to happen to me. The vi- <laughs> Bullet points here. The Vikings lost two critical pieces along their defensive line. They replaced them with Yannick Ngakwe, who is a good football player, but who got a contract that is way smaller than Preston Smith got. And the the fact that Vikings fans keep coming at me with the argument that he took a pay cut to get away from the Jaguars. No kidding, stupid. That's not the question. Why does he have to take a pay cut? Do you think Miles Garrett, if he said, I'm done, I'm leaving Cleveland, I'm never coming back, would have to take a $6 million pay cut to leave his team? No, he would not. He absolutely would not. Even if he was, let's just assume, he was only getting $18 million. If he was getting $18 million and he had one year left on his deal, and he said, I'm done, I'm leaving, do you think it would take like six months of him sitting out there with no suitors, and finally one team agrees if he agrees to take a $6 million pay cut, and he says, yep, sounds good, because he hates the Browns that much? There's no question he wants to leave the Jaguars desperately. The question is, why does he have to take a pay cut to leave? There are zero elite pass rushers that would have to take a pay cut down to twelve a one-year $12 million deal if he's that good, and the media just refuses to let go because they refuse to admit they've been wrong about Yannick this whole time. They've been pumping him up and pumping him up and pumping him up, and rather than just say, you know what, Pack Daddy, you were right. He's not that good. I was wrong, but clearly you were right because he took a $6 million pay cut and a one-year contract. Turns out... Pack Daddy was right. He's not actually all that good. He's not as good as he was cracked up to be. I talked about it before when everybody was freaking out about we should go get Yannick. It's like, you know what? He's going to be expensive, and we already have three that we like, and we, you know, he's not actually as good as, as he's probably going to get paid. Well, it turns out he didn't even get paid that much because the rest of the NFL knows he's not actually that good. Anyways, moving on. You don't have any corners. Oh, you're so stupid. We drafted Cam Dancer and Jeff Gladney. You're so stupid. And we got Mike Hughes. He was a first-round pick. Yeah, and the three guys that left, two of them were first-round picks and one of them was a second-round pick, and they were garbage and they're not with your team anymore. That's number one. You know how many NFL, how much NFL experience Jeff Gladney has? Zero NFL experience. You know how much NFL experience Cam Dantzler has? Zero NFL experience. You know how much experience uh, your uh, fifth-round pick Harrison Hand has? Zero You went out and got three corners, not because you've got elite corners everywhere, but because you desperately need them because you don't have any. You have Nate Meters, who had 11 snaps and is garbage. You have Mark Fields, who had six snaps and is garbage. Mike Hughes and Holton Hill are the only guys that have played. Holton Hill had 168 snaps. Mike Hughes had 500. Mike Hughes had a 58.7 overall grade, which is bad. I mean technically below average, but he's not good at football, and he was drafted in 2018. So he had 2018, and he had 2019, and he still can't get on the field, even though all your other, and I know there's injuries, whatever. He's just not good, man. And again, I don't like the argument of, well, he's good when he's not healthy, if he's never been good before. You can't just impute goodness to a guy that's never been good because he's been injured. You also have to prove you're good first. You can't just go to the NFL, hurt your ankle, and then play terribly, and then continue to play terribly, and then say, well, he's good when he's healthy. How do you know? You've never seen him play good. What, because of one game? Like Jeff Janis had one good game, or Kumaro had one good game, or Geronimo had one good game? Everybody has one good game, for crying out loud. It doesn't make you a good football player. Good football players are good football players because they're only bad for one game out of the year, not because they're good one game out of the year. Give, give me a break. You have no good corners anywhere. You have very good safeties. Not even going to argue with that. Never have, because I'm not just being biased. I'm just being honest. Your linebackers are massively overrated. You have one guy that was good last year, and that was basically the only time in his career he's ever been good at anything. Maybe he repeats it, but it's very unlikely, and even if he does, it's him and nobody else, because Anthony Barr has never really been good as a linebacker in the last, what, three, four years? 
despite the fact that the media refuses to say that and they just keep talking about how great of a duo this is, they're not good at stuff. There's, there's entire highlight reels of just them getting embarrassed. I remember, I watched them, I laughed very hard because I've been sitting here talking about how not good they are and Vikings fans were furious about how trash they are because they kept messing up. Entire games were lost because your linebackers couldn't cover people and couldn't stop the run. But I guess we all just forgot about that because now we have to talk about how elite they are because diluting yourself for a couple more weeks until you completely tank in the regular season apparently will at least make you feel good for a little while, which is fine. Go ahead and dilute yourself. That's fine. Your offensive line is trash. You know it is. You've got a good running back who can't stay healthy. You've got Thielen, who is now by himself. You've got Justin Jefferson, who you drafted. That's great, but he's not Stephon Diggs. He's also been relegated almost entirely to the slot. So if they're going to put him outside, he's going to be brand new to that. And if they just put him in the slot, he's only going to be out there when you have three wide receivers, which is rarely. Which means what? Ola B.C. Johnson is your wide receiver too? Maybe Tajay Sharp? I don't know. This, I mean, it's just, it's not a good football team. I'm sorry. I'm sure you'll make it work. I'm sure you'll win a, a decent chunk of games. But the fact of the matter is, last year, the Packers and the Vikings had an extremely easy schedule. The Packers steamrolled all these garbage teams, and the Vikings did not. The Lions, I like their roster, but they're the Lions. The offensive line is good, not great. The wide receivers are pretty solid. Stafford is pretty decent. You went out and got Swift, which would scare me if it was any other team, but the Lions continue to take swings at running back and continue to fail at that. Same goes for Hawkinson. We'll see. Maybe he takes a jump in in year two. Defensive line is going to be a problem. Flowers is solid, but he's kind of all you got. I do like your corners. I think Trufant is underrated. I think, you know, Okuda has a real good chance to be solid. I like your safeties. I think they're underrated. Your linebackers are straight trash, but maybe Collins will come in and help from New England. You've got issues probably less than the Vikings, but, you know, that's a separate issue. It is what it is. I mean, if, if Detroit was any other team, if that was just a roster, you'd look at it and go, that's pretty solid. But you got to factor in that it's Detroit. And then there's the Bears, who I really felt like there was a chance that they were going to do something special, but that entirely hinges on what the quarterback can do. It really does. Now, if you don't believe in... This is going to be one of those things where if you don't believe in PFF and you just believe what everybody else is telling you that the media tells you, which, by the way, you got to be careful with that. People wanted to throw in my face the fact that Matt LaFleur said that um, Yannick Ngakwe is an elite pass rusher or whatever his thing is. Have, have you ever heard him say anything other than this guy's elite? Ask him about any player on the, on the Vikings team or the Bears or whatever. He's going to say he's very, very talented. He said Kirk Cousins is elite. He talked about Christian Kirksey. It, I, it was funny because I was looking at it. Somebody threw out something about Christian Kirksey and how great he is. And then they, he talked about another Oh, that wide receiver, Malik Taylor, that we ended up keeping. How he's got all these explosive attributes and all this stuff. And Packer fans get excited about it. It's like, dude, he just says nice things about everybody. Stop listening to Matt LaFleur when he says stuff. Seriously. Because everybody's elite to Matt LaFleur. Because he's a polite person. But Mitch Trubisky won the job in Chicago. That doesn't help anything. Now again, just like every year, it's possible he he figured it out. But the best case scenario for this team is that they put Nick Foles in. Nick Foles is a good enough game manager. Montgomery, who is now injured, takes a step so they can lean on running the ball and just distributing the ball efficiently to Robinson and, and Miller, who hopefully Miller takes a step. None of these things are guarantees. We're just hoping everybody gets better, which if we allow that same thing to every team, then they're still in the same hole. The offensive line is very rapidly eroding. It'll be interesting to see if some of these guys bounce back. You look at a guy like Charles Leno. He was solid for about four years, had a terrible year last year. Why? Is he going to bounce back? Is there something I'm missing? I don't know. Cody Whitehair is, is really weird. His rookie year, he was the third best offensive lineman. Then he took a step back to being good for two years, and then he took a step back to being average. Why is he getting worse every year? That doesn't make any sense. Jermaine Effetti, who apparently is going to be their right guard, is pure garbage, and Bobby Massey has never really been all that good, and at his age of 31 years old, there's no real hope of him getting any better. So you've got a subpar offensive line, you've got Jimmy Graham and Cole Komet, which is just horrific, you've got Mitch Trubisky, who apparently won the starting job, which is horrific, you've got Montgomery, who you hoped would take a step, although everybody hopes that their young guys take a step, and then most of the time they don't, but either way, he's injured, so he won't be playing for a while. Um, The defensive line is still solid, right? You've got Khalil Mack, I think Quinn is, is somewhat underrated. He's not, he doesn't really grade out all that well, but in terms of his ability to bring pressure, he does a good job. The reason he doesn't grade out very well is he's terrible against the run. He is a solid pass rusher, though. 
which at the end of the day, that's what matters. He is an upgrade at pass rush. See, I can admit that. Yannick Ngakwe is not an upgrade. He's, he's maybe, I'll, I'll, I'll grant you that he's about the same as Everson Griffin, although I don't know that that's necessarily true, especially when you consider his ability to stop the run, which is zero. I think Robert Quinn is an upgrade for the Bears. You still have Akeem Hicks, who's solid. I think Fuller is massively overrated. Bears fans will never admit this. They think Kyle Fuller is still an elite cornerback, and they will throw the fact that he was a pro bowler in my face, which is hilarious. But the fact is, after Vic Fangio left, Kyle Fuller had to go back to doing what he's not very good at, which is playing man-to-man coverage. The Bears are another team that are desperately swinging at cornerback every chance they get, which is very rarely because they don't have any draft picks ever. But they did get Jalen Johnson in the second round. We'll see what he can bring. Linebackers, the I, see, and again, I, I don't know, man. Everybody says they have elite linebackers, and Roquan is one of the better young rookie linebackers in the game. PFF says he's straight trash. His overall grade was a 52. His run defense grade was a 53. His pass rush grade was a 51. His coverage grade was a 55. Translated 67th out of 90 overall. 63rd out of 92 against the run. 46th out of 76 in coverage. In other words, terrible. Danny Trevathan, I'm pretty sure this is a picture of Rashawn Gary. Dude, that is Seriously, go type in Danny Trevathan. Look in the third row under the images. There's a picture of him with glasses on. That is Rashawn Gary. What in the world is going Anyways, they don't like him either. And then there is Eddie Jackson. Eddie Jackson, and I've been saying this, he's one of those guys who had one really, really, really good year. Best safety in all of football in 2018. He got a bunch of money because of that year. And then he completely fell off. Now, again, Bears fans say that's not true. The media is going to say that's not true because that's what the media does. They hear the big names, and then they swarm around the big names, and then they swear by the big names. But I tend to trust PFF more than I trust the guys on ESPN because the guys on ESPN aren't watching every snap of every player on every game. I promise you because that's physically, humanly impossible to do. There's too many people. There's too many games. There's too much time. And so they rely on sort of this groupthink thing. And Eddie Jackson was seen as one of the best prospects in football. And again, when, you're, when, when, when you hear that they're the best, you don't always hear the follow-up the next year in which he wasn't as good this year. And so the best just kind of sticks in your head. Same with Yannick. He hasn't been good in like three years, but nobody knows that because nobody really talks about Yannick. But PFF had him 44th out of 83, which is actually right in line with what he was as a rookie. So 2017 and 2019, he was graded 68th and 67th. That's just kind of where he's at as a fourth-round prospect. Just decent. There's that one crazy year, which is the same crazy year as every single Bears player that wasn't that good but suddenly became good that one year, which happens to defenses sometimes. Again, I'll, supposed to be more bullet pointy than that, but I, I just I'm, I'm telling you, there's nothing here. They have a really good defensive line. They have nothing on offense outside of Allen Robinson. Zero things that are interesting on offense. I don't know if there's anything good on this defense outside of Akeem Hicks and Quinn and Mack, and probably Eddie Jackson being somewhat better than average, but not much. Now, will the Bears take a step in year two? I don't know, but it's it's going to take... Again, they're not going to do anything unless they figure out the quarterback thing, and it doesn't appear that they have. The reports out of camp are that the quarterbacks all look like garbage. It sounds like Trubisky won by default, and I'm still not convinced he's not going to lose his job eventually. But then you come to Green Bay. How's the offensive line? It's pretty solid. It's not perfect, but it's pre- especially if you look on the left side of the line, Bakhtiari, Jenkins, and Lindsley, great, great offensive line right there. Billy Turner, maybe not so much. Rick Wagner is a good football player. He was hurt last year. Again, I can say that he's good when he's not hurt because he has been every year that he wasn't hurt. Devontae Adams is one of the best wide receivers in football. Alan Lazard is a fine number two. Aaron Rodgers is clearly the best in the division. Aaron Jones is one of the best running backs in all of football. Zadarius Smith was the, probably the best pass rusher in football last year. Preston is a great compliment. Rashawn, there's every reason to believe he takes a step. Jair Alexander is a good cornerback. Kevin King, good enough. Kenny Clark, one of the best young defensive tackles in football. We don't have linebackers, but we'll see how it goes. And then Savage and Amos are a great duo. There's, there's no reason to look at the NFC North and say that this team finishes last. That's just stupid. I'm not even going to read the article. I'm just, ti- I'm, ju- I'm just tired of it. Now, on one hand, I want to say I can't wait for the Packers to just steamroll everybody and prove everybody wrong. 
But I do want to throw this one little thought out. Just throw it out into the universe, and then I'll just run away from it. There's a lot of talk about the Packers being fraudulent 13-3, and three, which, you know, you can take issue with the word fraudulent if you want. I don't really care. The, the point is, the play didn't match the record, and there shouldn't be any question about that. And the thought process on my part is, assuming certain things take place, especially along the offense, right, the... the the defense kind of settles in as they go into more basically year two, right? It's not tech, it's not literally year two, but it's technically year two because most of these guys are only going into their second year on the defense. So assuming they all improve a bit and assuming we've got a better understanding of the offense in year two, my expectation is we win less than 13 games but are a better football team. Here's the question, though, that I'm just going to just gonna let it hang out there because it, I, it basically was keeping me up last night thinking about it. Actually, it wasn't keeping me up last night it was i was playing madden on my phone because i don't have a console leave me alone i play madden mobile all right that's the best i've got and it's garbage but it, it helps whet my appetite a bit for football and i couldn't beat anybody and i don't know why and it was extremely frustrating and they cheated and i'm upset but i just kept losing and losing and losing and i couldn't help but feel like there's this weird possibility in which this isn't necessarily impossible And it's actually not that far-fetched that the Packers are a pretty bad football team. Again, just going to drop it out and leave it. But the assumption is we're not going to be a 13-win team. The record will get worse, right? More than than likely. Which is fine because you don't expect hardly any team to win 13 games. But the next assumption is the Packers will get better. What if they don't? What if it's more or less the same thing we saw last year, except harder opponents? What if we don't get better against the run? What if the passing game doesn't improve and we see the same kind of issues? And what if Zadarius does regress because, as I said, he had a nearly impossible year? The best pass rushers in football have those kinds of years like once. Khalil Mack has had that good of a year basically once in his career. So it's not impossible that Zadarius regresses. And it's nearly impossible that Preston duplicates what he did in terms of sack totals. We assume Jair takes a step the same way we assume Jair will take a step last year, but he didn't. We assume Kevin King will get better because he had a really good stretch of like three or four games at the end of the season, but what if he doesn't? We assume Darnell Savage will get better because although he was good last year, he was good for a rookie. We hope that he gets better the same way we hope Jair would get better, but he just kind of stayed the same as he was his rookie year. We don't know that the offensive line isn't going to take a big step back, especially on the right side of the line. We don't know what's going to happen over there. We don't know any of these tight ends are going to be any good. In fact, Every year I'm excited about something about the tight end group, and every year I'm let down. I was excited about Jace, I was excited about Jimmy, I was excited about Martellus and Cook. Excited about everybody, and let down every single year. So, if we just don't assume everybody gets better, and we look at the almost guarantee that a couple of these guys are going to take at least a half a step back. That's not to say Zadarius isn't still a really good pass rusher. But if, if those guys, Darius and Preston, kind of just take a step back and, and everybody that we just assume is going to get better doesn't get better, and we still can't stop the run, which apparently they couldn't do in training camp, the, the Packers just ran all over them, which we could just say, well, that's because they're so good at running now. Yeah, maybe. Or maybe this team that got completely embarrassed by the 49ers who threw like two passes the entire game because they didn't need to do anything but run because we couldn't stop it. Maybe that defense still hasn't figured out how to stop the run. Which is especially scary when you look at the fact that the Vikings like to run the ball. The Saints, I mean, the Saints are just the Saints. The Falcons went and added a running back, which you wouldn't think would be a big deal. Shouldn't be a big deal, but we'll see. We got the Vikings, we got the 49ers, we got the Colts, who are just going to be a demon to try to stop the run. The Bears are going to be more committed to the run. The Eagles destroyed us on the ground. The Carolina Panthers have Christian McCaffrey. The Tennessee Titans have Derrick Henry. The Bears again in Week 17. I mean, I I mentioned it before, but stopping the run is going to be a critical piece to this season. Absolutely cannot even get to the playoffs if teams can just run the ball and beat you. So that's got to get cleaned up. So I'm I'm not predicting anything. It's just, I'm just positing a theory the same way I've been positing for a while that they're going to get better. The question, though, is what if they don't? What does that mean? It's probably not good. Because the team we saw last year was was barely good enough to be a playoff team. The reason that they, they got to where they were was a couple of really solid defining characteristics, which hopefully can stay the same. Number one, it was a team that, that had 100% belief and confidence in themselves, which is something we haven't seen from a Packers team in a long time. 
Under Mike McCarthy, it was a team that just gave up. If things weren't going well, they quit and they lost. This team never gave up. And largely, the defense was the other key component. The Packers had a really good offense and a really good defense. And occasionally, they would fail. But when one would fail, the other would pick up the slack. And we've seen several times where the defense would come up big and make big plays down the stretch, which is something we never used to see in the past. And those couple characteristics are what carried this team that really was a dysfunctional unit all the way into the playoffs and through the playoffs, which, again, doesn't mean they didn't deserve it. They did deserve it because they had those characteristics. And those characteristics matter, clearly, because they translated into a bunch of wins. But again, we don't know what 2020 brings, and that kind of makes me nervous. And I'm sorry if I'm being a bummer my way on my uh, return to the podcast, but it was a thought, and I um, should at least put it out there. But, but, but again, it, it, it has nothing to do with the macro sense of believing the Packers will be the worst team in football. There's no reason to believe that. It's possible. The same way it's possible the Vikings are last in the division, the Bears and the Lions are last in the division. But it's much easier to make that case for the Vikings, the Lions, and the Bears than it is for the Packers, which is the point. As much as you could say, well, anybody can make the claim that they're going to get better, mm, not really. I mean, you can technically because it's possible, but there has to be something behind it if you're going to actually posit that as a theory. What is, what is your foundation for believing that for the Vikings? I got nothing. Yannick is a downgrade. Justin Jefferson is a downgrade. Your corners are likely downgrades. Your one good linebacker is going to have a down year, down to what he always is. I mean, when, when everything good about your team is everybody playing their best, Daniil Hunter had his best year ever. Kirk Cousins had his best year ever. Eric Hendricks had his best year ever. That's not a good foundation to start with and say we're going to get even better this year. No, I don't think so. So anyways, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just tired of it. I'm frustrated with it. And um, tired of people saying things that are dumb. Not really sure where this is headed, but why don't we stop here, take a quick break, and... Um, We'll, we'll, we'll see what's on the other side. Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have, because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple. Just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop, that's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place, and you can get the app and try it out for yourself. So go ahead and test drive U.S. Cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days. That's U.S. Cellular, built for us. Terms apply. Awards based on open signal independent data. So go to uscellular.com for all the details. I want to tell you guys real quick about our new sponsor, Factor. Factor makes delicious, ready-to-eat meals, and they get sent right to your door. They have 35 different options every single week that you can choose from, including keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and more. And there's even more to enjoy with over 55 nutrition-packed add-ons that help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. There's no prep work. There's no messing up six different bowls, mixing stuff. Factor meals are 100% ready to heat and eat. No prep, no cook, no cleanup. Factor is also very flexible with your schedule. You can get as much or as little as you need by choosing between 6 to 18 meals per week. You can also pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Factor is less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved. So head to factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 and use code packdaddy50 to get 50% off. That's code packdaddy50 at factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 to get 50% off. So why don't we start with this whole debacle on the right side of the line? Now there's two different dynamics here, and I don't want to get them mixed up because this is one of those areas where it's easy for people to, to want to say things to just move the goalpost back and forth whatever, to whatever suits them. There's the dynamic that people are injured, and then there's the dynamic of what the Packers want their starter to be, remove injury from the equation. Everybody is making a very, 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 very big deal about what the Packers want the starting lineup to look like. Let's remove injury from the equation for now. Again, we're removing that from the equation. So let's not, let's burn that into your brain, because I know how this works. I start talking about things, and they're like, yeah, but he's injured. No, 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 no. Separate discussion. There are a lot of people who are making a big deal about the Packers haven't decided who the starting right tackle is going to be or whatever. I have zero reason to believe that that's true. 
Well, the coach said it. Of course it's written. No, no, no. Here's a question. Who cares? <laughs> Who cares what the coach said? Let, let's revisit the whole thing. Remember when the people on, uh, on the Packers beat were throwing a temper tantrum? Remember that a couple weeks ago or so, and I was saying I was getting tired of it, and a couple of them didn't bother to participate in that whole thing, and a couple of them just refused to stop. Do you know what I'm referring to? It's the thing where the Packers said, you're not allowed to say who's starting where, because it gives us a competitive advantage if the Vikings don't know who's starting where. So we have people in the media going to the Packers and saying, who's going to be your right tackle? And LaFleur says, I don't know, we haven't figured it out yet. And everyone goes, oh my goodness, can you believe it? There's an open competition, and maybe Billy Turner, and maybe it's Elton Jenkins, and what are we going to do? Like, are you serious? You're, you're going into a frenzy over that? And, 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 and again, it's one of those things where we got to take things in context, and maybe I'm missing something here, but... If you have a, a reporter come out and say, are you considering starting Elton Jenkins at right tackle? And they go, well, we're leaving our options open. That doesn't mean anything because you asked the question. It's different if they come out and say that we're going to try Elton Jenkins at right tackle because we're really concerned about Rick Wagner and his injury. And we're, we just really think Billy Turner's garbage and we just don't know what to do. So we're going to try Elton there and maybe we're going to have to put him there. That's not anything that anybody has said. And I, it's, it's one of the weirdest things ever. And I understand if, if you're just reading an article in which people are making a big deal about it, and then you make a big deal about it because it sounds like that's information. But to have these reporters ask questions, which you got to understand, when you're asking a question, you're leading into something. But yet reporters don't take it that way. They take it as confirmation that my suspicions are correct. For example, I could pick any random wide receiver. I could say Equinemius. And I could say, you know, Equinemius looked really good in camp. What do you think the odds are that he gets a good amount of playing time against the Vikings? And they say, we really like what Equinemius did, and he's really making strides, and we were really excited to get him back from injury, and we think he can have a real big impact on this team. Blah, 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 right? All coach speak nonsense. Not that it isn't necessarily nonsense, but it's all just coach speak. And again, they're only saying nice things about him because I picked him out of the pile. And then I go write an article that says the, the Matt LaFleur singles out Equinemius and talks about how great he is and, and, and talks about his impact on the team and, and what the... Uh, 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 uh. The same thing would have happened if I picked MVS. Or, as we saw, Malik Taylor. When asked about Malik Taylor, what did Matt LaFleur do? He went on a big tirade about all his elite attributes and explosion and all this great stuff that made it sound like he should be our number two wide receiver. He's only saying it because you asked. And obviously they're keeping him for a reason, but if you put it in the fuller context of how does he compare to Alan Lazar, it's quite a ways down the list. So the fact of the matter is there there are injury concerns, but let's if we just, again, remove injury from the equation. I have zero reason to believe that Rick Wagner is not the right tackle, Billy Turner is not the right guard, Corey Lindsley is our center, Elton Jenkins is our left guard, David Bakhtiari is our left tackle. And I, I genuinely don't think the injuries are that substantial. Maybe they are, but again, the Packers want there to be a lot as much mystery as possible. They want there to be as much doubt as possible. This whole thing where we might have a left guard play and right tackle is the best possible scenario for messing with the Vikings because they have to try to prepare. And if they don't know who's playing guard or tackle, they don't know if Rick Wagner's playing, they don't know if Billy Turner's playing guard or tackle, they don't know if Elton Jenkins is playing left guard, right guard, or right tackle, they don't know if Lane Taylor is going to be playing, and if he is, is he going to be playing guard? Could he possibly be playing tackle? This This is all great for the Packers, and they want this to be the thing. And I get questioned, well, why haven't they called Jared Valdir? It's simple. Because you're panicked about it, and the Packers aren't. It's because there's mystery in your mind, but not theirs. They know what they're doing. They're not worried about right tackle. There's slight concern about injury, but the fact of the matter is the biggest thing that they have going for them right now is the fact that they know something that the Vikings don't. They know, again, pending injury, who the right tackle is going to be, who the right guard is going to be. They, they're they not th- just a couple days away still trying to go, oh, man, I don't know, what, what should we do with this offensive line? Well, maybe we could, maybe we could put him here. And no, they they got it figured out, man. They got their depth chart all figured out. I promise you, they do. They don't want the Vikings to know. So every time you ask, up until the day of the game, they're gonna go. I don't know. It's the same reason why all during the season, when there's injuries, they wait until the last possible second. There's a guy who's got a stub toe, and they're gonna let him sit out. And then you ask them, are they going to play? They know the guy's going to play, but what are they going to tell you? I don't know. We'll, we'll see what happens. They don't want the opponents to know if he's going to be playing or not. And we got everybody whipped up into a frenzy. Oh, my goodness. We got to call in Valdir. It's a disaster. 
And uh, what are we going to do? Elton Jenkins is going to be playing tackle, and maybe it's going to be better. He's going to be a great tackle. And, da, 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 da. and again, maybe it'll happen, but if it happens, it's because of injury. It has nothing to do with the Packers' plans. Separate discussion. So, I mean, Rick Wagner has an elbow brace. Billy Turner apparently has a knee injury. I'm not trying to downplay it, but, you know, <laughs> again, th- this just works to the Packers' favor. And, um, I mean, granted, if, if they're hurt real bad, they're also going to not want to tell you that because they want you to think that they're going to play. They just don't want the Vikings to know. And if we know, the Vikings know. So we're never going to find out until basically game day or, or close to it because it, it drastically changes how the Vikings prepare. Again, I'm not predicting anything because I don't know the nature of their injuries and I'm not probably not going to know until they have to put a designation on them. And at this particular point in time, they have not come out with an injury designation. I feel like they usually do that on Wednesday, which would be, I believe, today. No, today's Tuesday, so it might be tomorrow. I'm not positive about that. But again, it's, it's, it feels similar to what I said about the practice squad, where it's, it's, it feels like big news because it should be big news, but it's really not that big a news. Now, this is really big news if we genuinely believe Rick Wagner and Billy Turner are injured, because now it's like, what in the world are we going to do? But assuming these are things that these guys can work through, and I... I genuinely believe that it is it's possible that it's not but how many times have we seen guys throughout the training camp get injuries and they sat out for a very long time not because they're really hurt but just because we want to make sure that they're healthy it's not impossible but it would just be really surprising if the only real consequential injuries come like at the the very last week we got two guys that get very injured But we haven't heard anything about IR. We haven't heard anything about x-rays. We haven't heard anything about MRIs, torn this, ripped up that. We just know very vaguely Billy Turner is dealing with a knee injury. Rick Wagner currently has an elbow brace. Which, if they're bracing it, they probably have a pretty good idea what's wrong with it, right? So it's not not broken. It's not something that's going to put them on IR. They've, They've figured out the remedy, and it's a brace. And usually, guys can play with braces. So I don't I'm just, I'm not worried about it. I believe it's going to be Rick Wagner and Billy Turner on the right side. I think that's always been the plan, and I think the Packers like the fact that there's doubt for the same reason that they didn't want the media telling you who's playing where. They're still not telling us who's playing where because they don't want the Vikings to know who's playing where. And it might seem stupid because it's just one game, and then once we roll out our offensive line, everybody knows what we're doing. In fact, the Vikings know what we're doing after the first play. But this isn't baseball. There's only 16 games, and if you can get a, a, a half a slight sliver of an edge... It's worth it, because every game is massive, especially in the beginning of the year when everyone's struggling and we don't even know how to tackle yet. I don't know if the Packers figured that out the entire year last year, how to tackle, but I'm just, I'm not, I'm not whipped up about it at all. Something to possibly monitor, but until there's anything concrete saying somebody's actually genuinely very injured, I don't have any reason to believe that they are. In fact, it sounds like Billy Turner is, is more concerning, but... And again, I'm not trying to be rude here, but number one, that has nothing to do with Jared Veldier, who's attacked. Number two, we have Lane Taylor, who I actually think is a better guard than Billy Turner, so I'm definitely not worried about it. I'm just not. So again, we'll we'll revisit this once the injury reports come out a little more thoroughly. But from what I can tell, Billy Turner's injury, all I can see is expected to miss some time, expected to possibly miss a week or two, maybe won't play against the Vikings. I don't see anything about Rick Wagner saying he's going to miss time. I just see he's got an elbow brace. So, again, I don't know what that has to do with Jared Valdir. I don't know what that has to do with how the starting offensive line is going to shake out long term. I don't know what any of this has to do with anything. And I'm, I'm addressing it because it's like the biggest news that everybody wants to talk about, and I'm just seeing no information here. None of this is interesting to me. Well, the, the, the coach says he, he doesn't know. Right, because he's lying to you. <laughs> just like he's lying when he said Yannick is an elite, one of the better young pass rushers in football. That's a lie. And I'm sure he's even telling his players that because he wants them to be up to speed. Like, don't take this guy for granted. He's really good. It's coach stuff, man. He said Kirk Cousins is elite. Malik Taylor's elite. Everybody's great. Everybody's perfect. That's why you don't go to a coach and a press conference to determine how good players are. That's a terrible way to do it. It's probably worse than ESPN, which is saying a lot. I would take Skip Bayless over Matt LaFleur. Now, not in real life. I would much rather talk to Matt LaFleur in, like, a, a film session or something to learn stuff. But a press conference... He's just going to be nice. He's just going to be polite. Oh, yeah, we got to watch out. They're really good. Watch. What? You don't believe me? Watch. We, we're going up against some really, really good teams and some really, really trash teams. Matt LaFleur will get up in front of the podium when we go up against trash teams, and he will talk about how great they are, how scary they are, how we got to watch out for this, and they've got some of the best young this, and, and they're really underrated in this facet, and we got to be on our game because of this. He's going to say it about the Saints, 
And he's going to say it about the Jaguars. Don't listen to the coach about how good players are. Not a good source of information on that type of information. It's not that everything they say is useless, but certain things, there's no point in even asking them. Anyways, I guess I'll cut it off there. I I feel like I can ramble and rant about other random little things, but uh, now that I'm home and I can kind of get my bearings a little bit and organize my thoughts and what's going on and maybe actually construct a better layout for tomorrow's episode, I I think on on Thursday I do want to do at least a, maybe not a full episode, but part of it, kind of looking at the Thursday night football game. Very, very excited, and it's actually going to be a good game, which is awesome. I'm very upset that I don't have any uh, Chiefs or Houston Texans players on either of my fantasy football teams for the Packernet group. However, I've got one more draft coming up. We decided last minute to throw one together with some people at work and whatnot, so I may have to go out of my way to either get a Chiefs player or a Texans player so I have some additional vested interest in the game. But that should be a really exciting game, and I really hope the Texans win. Partially because I think the Texans are, are... underrated. I know their quarterback is underrated. As much as people like him, I don't think he's appreciated for quite as good as he is. And the Chiefs starting the season 0-1 would just be an extra little cherry on top. So, I don't know. That's probably what I'll continue to work on today is kind of lay out a uh, a little bit of a timeline for the week. Continue to send in any questions or whatever you got. That's another thing I have to round up is some questions to work on. But I want to keep that ramped up. What I want to get away from this year that I did last year was to have such a rigid schedule. I had everything laid out exactly how, you know, every day was, you know, on Monday it was my initial breakdown, Tuesday was the PFF breakdown, and then I don't know what the other ones were, and then, you know, Saturday was, I don't know, it just, it was, it was very rigid, and I want to kind of get away from that and leave it a little bit more open, so keep the questions coming in, the thoughts, whatever it is you got, because uh, it's football season, man, we made it, I cannot believe we made it, but we made it, the off-season schedule is officially over, so happy. But anyways, I will uh, talk to you tomorrow. You folks have yourselves a good one. Bye-bye.